friends welcome to the 157th session of legal empowerment through interaction lecture series as the as we proceed in this journey of empowerment discovery and enlightenment i believe yesterday being human rights day it's only befitting that today we touch upon a subject though not fully covering human rights as such but a very important facet of it choice in marriage either it is by design or default you get into matrimony so today neema noor will be uh, enlightening us and that too with the stage set by prem and the final nail being driven in by justice ram kumar himself <laughs> so today uh, i'm sure that we can we'll be able to say that an afternoon well spent so without wasting any time i may request prem to deliver the introductory remarks well uh, today's topic it doesn't fall within a narrow compass at all in fact it's an ocean a right to life it is accomplished at the point at which one has all the rights all throughout his life and every human is brought into this world free and liberated from all duties allowed to pick up their way of living and no individual whosoever can meddle in their life or tie them down without their free will to restrict the scope of their right to life now as we know marriage is an institution which has transformed over the years not drastically but slowly and steadily over the centuries and our ancestors they had a totally different concept of marriage whereas we know the current generation has their own ideas and interpretations now changes to marriage that we take for granted they were very controversial before for instance if you can uh, earlier nobody used to subscribe to the concept of the same sex marriage to the times of today when the judiciary has almost declared it legal in almost all the countries and in the matter which is pending before the delhi high court regarding this issue the solicitor general he would contend that it is against our culture of course it is personal view and we know it is still not completely acceptable in our society likewise we could never imagine of a living relationship now our country has witnessed a sea change in the way the couple now perceive their relationships to be and in some cases marriage has even reformed to marry not to have children it may appear to be strange but it is true and in the olden days the marriage it that completely reformed the very lifestyle of a female as they would be forced to leave their home and surrender their identity now history would tell us that the marriage in the olden days they were based on strategic alliances of the kings right from the anglo saxon society you can see marriage was never not about relationship even though it's not in a relationship sense which we interpret today the anglo saxon society they saw the institution as a tool to establish strategic tie between two empires and the situation in india also was almost like the same suppose a king when he felt the need to acquire a certain territory he used to marry the princess of that particular province and marriage was no no longer it was based on the consent of a woman and it depended solely on the will of the male so marriage was basically based on the king's will and his desire to acquire the property and in those days we could see that the bride had to virtually agree to the father's wishes or the male's wishes and oblige to that marriage this concept of marriage you can see beautifully described in a ruling by the madras high court justice mohan speaking for the bench in shivanaru was a state of tamil nadu 1985 to llj 133 which in fact was a writ seeking for a certiorari fight mandamus to quash an order terminating the petitioner's service as a teacher on the ground that she got married and the court considers the views of joseph addison george eliot mahatma gandhi then frederick william robertson etc and the court goes on to say what exactly is a marriage and remember that's a labor kings now as of today we know that the right to marry it's available to all indians and lata singh was a state of uttar pradesh ar 2006 supreme court 2522 taking note of the fundamental rights which are guaranteed in our constitution the apex court speaking through justice markande kadju goes on to hold that ours is a free and democratic country and once a person becomes a major he or she they can definitely marry whosoever he or she likes 
and if the parents of the boy or the girl if they do not approve such a interreligious or intercaste marriage the maximum they could do is that they can cut off their social relations either with their son or daughter but they can never give the threats or commit or instigate any acts of violence and they can never harass the person who undergoes such a marriage and in that particular case you can see the supreme court goes on to direct the administration as soon as the police authorities throughout the country to see that if any boy or girl who is a major who undergoes such a marriage then and if he is a major or she is a major the couple is not harassed by anyone or they are not subjected to any threats or the acts of violence and anyone who would give such threats or acts of violence and commit such acts or commit such a violence either himself or he may instigate and do it through somebody they would be taken to task by instituting criminal proceedings by the police against them and further stern action is also taken against those persons as provided by law now our article 21 which deals with the right to life that is almost coupled with article 16 of the universal declaration of human rights which was adopted by the general assembly of the un as early as during 10th of december 1948 now yesterday as chairman as i mentioned was the human rights day and this is the 72nd year of the universal declaration of human rights and we see around a fortnight back on 28th of november last month the up governor promulgated an ordinance on unlawful conversion which is named as the uttar pradesh prohibition of unlawful religious conversion law of 2020 so that is the contemporary relevance of today's topic now even though this ordinary uh, i mean uh, even though this ordinance at a primary blush it would appear to have been bought to prevent unlawful conversions either by fraud coercion undue influence etc which goes to postulate that such marriage could be declared as void by the court if it is solely done for the purpose of unlawful con- conversion or vice versa and it contains various penal provisions which are cognizable and non bailable imposing imprisonment which would range from uh, up to 10 years statutory minimum is 1 year you have fines ranging from 15000 uh, to 50000 and you have a compensation clause of 5 lakhs but a closer look of this law it will make clear that it is absolutely unconstitutional and it is flagrantly flouting the laws which are laid down by the supreme court now if you see the position earlier there were similar laws which existed in the pre independence era as well as post independence also in the pre independence era some of the indian princely states like kota patna udaipur kalahandi they all passed laws against these religious conversions in an attempt to preserve the hindu religious identity from the british missionaries of course it was against conversion to christianity and some of these laws were the rajgarh state uh, conversion act of 36 you had the patna freedom of religion act of 42 the sarguja state assembly i mean the state apostasy act of uh, 1945 and the udaipur anti conversion act of uh, 1946 now post independence there was statutes like uh, orissa freedom of religion act that was a 67 act the madhya pradesh freedom of religion act of 78 you had a tamil nadu prohibition of forcible conversion of religion act uh, which was uh, during 2002 then you had in gujarat a similar act during 2003 Himachal Pradesh Freedom of Religion Act of 2006, and finally the Uttarakhand Freedom of Religion Act of 2018, and the constitutional validity of the Uttar Pradesh Statute and the Madhya Pradesh Statute that were upheld by a constitutional bench of the Apex Court in uh, Stains Laws was the State of Madhya Pradesh, AR 1977 Supreme Court 908, only in terms of Article 25, Clause 1, holding that there is absolutely no fundamental right. by which you can convert one person into your own religion and now it is learned that two lawyers they have petitioned the supreme court challenging the up statute as also the uh, i mean the up ordinance as also the uttarakhand statute and the notice has been issued now the most striking provision of the up ordinance is the one which deals with the burden of proof ordinarily when someone alleges in a criminal case when someone someone alleges that something has happened it is up to his or him to either prove it and the burden of proof in a criminal case is always on the prosecution of course we are having several other special statutes and the presumption is that any person who is accused of committing an offence is innocent until he is proved to be guilty 
Now this UP ordinance that turns this rule on its head, and every religious conversion is presumed to be illegal, and the burden rests on the person carrying out the conversion to prove that it was not illegal. As a whole, you can see the entire provisions in this particular ordinance that would put an uh, incredible chilling effect on the very freedom of conscience. And in view of the recent UP ordinance, perhaps it is now time to revisit the judgment of the Supreme Court in Stainslaw's case. Because the freedom of conscience means nothing if every act of religious conversion is going to be presumed illegal unless proven otherwise. Now, today we are on the topic of regarding the choice to marry. We have the judgments right from 1928 of Justice Rogers in Hassan Kutiberi versus Jainaba, which is 1928, volume 55, MLJ 828, to the latest four decisions, the one constitution bench decision, as well as uh, the three, three judges bench, all headed by Chief Justice Deepak Mishra, which are uh, one is Sony Gari versus Gari Douglas, that is AR 2018 Supreme Court 346. Then you have the Shafin Jahan's case, 2018, 16 SEC 368, which we popularly know as the Hadiya case. You have the Shakti Wahini case, AR 2018 Supreme Court 1601. And finally, you have the Joseph Shrine versus Union of India, AR 2018 Supreme Court 4898. And the judgment in Shakti Wahini that has content honor killings, holding that in the name of class or elevated honor of clan, nobody can have a final say to impose any sentence for anyone having married someone harboring a notion that they are a law unto themselves or that they are the ancestors of Caesar or Louis XIV. This has been written in the judgment because our constitution and our laws, they do not countenance such acts. Now, in this particular judgment, you can see preventive, remedial and punitive measures also were laid on by the apex court in that case. And the judgment of Chief Justice Deepak Mishra, in his very first sentence of this judgment, he quotes the famous French philosopher and thinker, Simon Weil, that liberty taking the world in its uh, concrete sense, that would consist in the ability to choose. And you can also see the Constitution bench decision, of course, one cannot be oblivious of uh, the 242nd report of the Law Commission of India as well in this particular uh, subject. Now, we all would have heard the terms like uh, Lao Jihad, Garwapas, and now the recent trend in our country, as we know, that is to sensationalize each and every case of interreligious or intercaste marriage. I, I mean, interreligious, particularly Lao Jihad, or like Garwapasi, even if there was a platonic love between the spouses before. Now, even judges are swayed. I have to openly say, our Kerala High Court in uh, Shahenshah was the state of Kerala, 2010, 1 KLD, Kerala Law Digest, page 20. Justice K.T. Shankaran, who of course was one of the finest ju judges our High Court has ever seen, even he was swayed. And it is stated by him that there is a movement or a project which we call the Romeo Jihad or the Lao Jihad, which is conceived by a sect of Muslims. And the idea appears to be to convert the girls belonging to other religions to Islam. And it is also seen stated that the Muslim boys are directed to pretend love to girls of other religions and get them converted to Islam. Now, recognizing this uh, universal declaration of human rights in the ninth judges bench in Justice Puttaswamy versus Union of India, 2017 tendency page one, which we popularly know as the right to privacy judgment. In that judgment, we see the Supreme Court giving us an insight into the abstract formulation of decisional autonomy. And there were six separate judgments in this case. Now, going by the judgment, we see that the decisional autonomy is the one aspect of privacy that overlaps precisely across the formulation adopted by <coughs> maybe all these judges who delivered the judgment, especially Justice Chandrachu, who delivered this judgment for and on behalf of himself, Justice Keha, Chief Justice Keha, Justice Agarwal, and Justice Abdul Nazir. He has made it clear that uh, the decisional autonomy that comprehends intimate personal choices. You can see Justice Nariman's judgment. He observes that uh, privacy of choice that protects an individual's autonomy over the fundamental personal choices. And a slightly different formulation was endorsed by Justice Chalameshwar in his three-pronged decision. Now, Justice Bobte emphasized the centrality of choice. And of course, Justice Sanjay Kishan Kaur, he in his opinion also says that choice was a central part. And finally, you have Justice Abhay Manohar Sapre, who goes on to hold that it was not possible for the framers of the constitution to incorporate each and every right to be 
a natural or a common law of an individual and it is not there in part 3 of the constitution and as and when the occasion arises to decide as to whether a particular right which is alleged by a citizen is a fundamental right or not he goes on to hold that the apex court with the process of uh, its judicial interpretation would recognize with remarkable clarity several existing uh, natural and common laws or the rights of an individual as fundamental rights which would fall under part 3 even though it is not defined in the constitution and we need to realize that going by the constitution our laws and the judgments of the supreme court it is clear that the faith the state and the courts they have no jurisdiction over an adult's absolute right to choose a life partner the intimacies of marriage that lie within the core zone of privacy which is inviolable and the choice of a life partner whether it is either by marriage or outside it that is a part of an individual's personhood and identity and ours is a free and democratic country and any interference either by the state or even by the judiciary in an adult's right to love and marry that would have a chilling effect on freedoms and the absolute right of an individual to choose a life partner that is not in the least affected by matters of faith now i do not want to stretch on more to deal with the topic today we have a wonderful speaker who needs no introduction at all on this platform we have heard neema on a couple of occasions and i had read some of her articles and also a book which she authored at great length dealing with gender equality and equality and i'm certain that she would shed more light on this topic now neema it's all yours thank you thank you thank you prem and uh, we recognize and welcome uh, justice uh, ramakrishnan sir also uh, vijay long time you not been seen uh, so over to you neema let us see your choice of marriage <laughs> Oh my God! Uh, it's the biggest challenge for me today, because speaking after this introduction by Premetan and then concluding remarks by Ram Kumar Sir, I'm in fact sandwiched between two people who have made <laughs> the interview so clear, high, loud, and uh, this is this deliberation will be like a um, mirror of you know. I would like to you know bring a lot of opinions from the panel here, because um, as we are celebrating the Human Rights Day. uh and uh, are we really having the so called rights so called human rights is a question that i want to put across to all of you because see um, every every year we take this day to celebrate maybe we conduct a lot of seminars now webinars but ultimately uh, are, are these justices uh, i mean are these rights uh, in its actual form uh, in in its form delivered it's a question that i need to you know ask the audience out here now why did i choose this topic uh, i guess um, um premet and already told you know the contemporary time uh, is so challenging and i'm happy that i'm speaking this from kerala rather than in the somewhere in delhi or up where i would have not uh, you know before i finished speaking this particular topic i would have been manhandled uh, lynched you know, lynched i would have lynched and there are so many reasons for lynching other than this like my name uh, my identity and my uh, you know surname is mohammed and you know so many reasons and then things again how can how dare you speak on this topic well uh, so that is why i said like i'm safe here in kerala to speak on this topic now um, moving ahead uh, to this topic right uh, to choice in marriage the topic is not right to marriage but the choice in marriage that is i have decided to marry now i'll decide whom to marry this is my larger contention so uh, i'm not even arguing that uh, about the larger uh, you know uh, concept of right to marry but my right to marry whom now early the villain was family but now there is a new villain for me that is the state now uh, the state is so uh, you know in malayalam we would uh, i have heard a very common language i mean common dialogue eight and end kaaryathil oru vaadu uttaravathaan i mean seriously that i don't understand what responsibility state is actually having in my personal uh, choice uh, when it comes to a very important decision of life that is getting into one of the most sacred institution the so called marriage now uh, see uh, basically for people like all of us as um, shamed and also said sometime it is a compulsion that we enter into this uh, particular institution because the sociological clock ticks and your family says yeah you are ready now all set 
now yes you are all set to you know be that um, uh, you know the so called um, uh, ornamental uh, things that happen that has to happen in the sociological uh, theme so it is that what is really happening till now but slowly changes are happening people have accepted things like living relationship and uh, good thanks to the legislature like uh, domestic violence act wherein openly it speaks about the living relationship so slowly slowly the nature of marriage is changing so at the same time you have to understand one thing um, along with the changing nature of marriage there are certain things that is allied that is what is most important at the bedrock of a, a marriage is not that two individual belong to this particular class not that this two individual belong to this particular caste not that this two individual belong to this particular religion but what we all have to see is does these two individual have something in common to compatible with each other for a longer journey of life and we hear a lot of trolls nowadays like husbands are harassed i see a lot chamet and posting in whatsapp you know to save himself from the you know the so called uh, you know uh, wife harassments see uh, maybe it is a troll life jokes but ultimately don't you think somewhere down the line we are all frustrated uh, at the end of the day with this institution just because it was out of somebody's compulsion so this post marital issues that i would really say i would argue even the post marital rights would not have been discussed this length and breadth and would not have been this sort sort of an issue if the pre marital right was properly convinced if i had the right to choice with a person and if i had married a person at a particular point of time i would have never you know i have always heard you know there is huge difference between arranged marriage and love marriage is that in love marriage you won't blame your parents ultimately you are just but in arranged marriage you have a lot of scope to you know blame your parents because it was somebody's we were customizing with somebody's choice so this particular narration is such a common dialogue that we all have why the question is why because somewhere down the line you were not given a, a chance or uh, to choose the right person of your own you know mindset now there are so many factors to end up with this why because we live in a very different socio political economic society where in india we still uh, we wait to come yeah yes um so in india we still uh, i would particularly say about the gender women has still doesn't have the choice to choose why because of the familial patriarchy that still exists that i still can't raise my voice and i don't have the guts that to say that i am in in love with a person first of all to say that you need a lot of guts and to say that he doesn't belong to my religion or our religion or our caste it requires even more guts so uh, that is the scenario that we if that prevails and in this scenario i'm going to speak something from the legal angle you know uh, i'm not a social i'm not a social sociologist i'm not a politician i'm i'm, I'm just a legal scholar, you know researcher who's trying to unpack from the constitutionalism that we have from uh, the 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 international conventions that we hold we have ratified and i'm speaking from the legal lens how far this particular right to choose the person whom i wish to live for here and for eternity for people who believe in life of thereafter i wish to you know take a small analytical uh, uh, you know i'm just throwing a few light you know because i already premeditated and given a very you know uh, uh, in depth analysis of this precedents but i'm just taking a you know i'm just going to give a panoramic view of everything in an order that's it so uh, first of all i would like to say we have the convention on i don't know how many of us know that we have a convention on consent to marriage minimum age for marriage and registration of marriage in 1962 where in the article 1 of this particular convention says that no marriage shall be legally entered into without the full and free consent of both parties now one of the most important element that comes into every marriage is consent but unfortunately we hardly discuss this particular element of consent and uh, well i had an opportunity to go into the nuances of this uh, the concept of consent when i was reading islamic law of divorce uh, islamic law of marriage where in islam the very basic element with which this marriage uh, you know really rely on is regarding the free consent 
so this is where i happen to read uh, you know apart from the you know international conventions and the law that is prevailing one of the uh, important religious text that is the holy quran speaks about free consent now at the same time as a uh, 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 premitan already told about udhr see in udhr the article 16 very clearly and expressly says that men and women of full age without um, any limitation to do due to race nationality religion have the right to marry and to found a family so they are entitled equal rights as to marriage during marriage and its dissolution so here again it says that it's all about um, it's about your right to choose the right person now coming into one of the most important um, uh, convention which even india has ratified it is a sedom that is a convention on the elimination of all forms of discrimination against women uh, which was um, passed in the year 1979 wherein it says that the, you know men and women have equal right to enter into marriage the same right of women freely to choose a spouse and to enter into marriage only within their full and free consent so basically again these conventions again try to highlight the fact that the bedrock of this entrance to this institution is none other than your free consent now at the same time it goes on to say that the same rights and responsibility during marriage and its dissolution the same rights and responsibility to women as a parent in respect of the marital status so everywhere you can see that this is a fundamental right indeed so i can i just wish to quote one of the judgment of um, the us that is uh, the cleveland board of education versus left floor with a citation with 414 us 632 where justice to what held that freedom of personal choice in matters of marriage and family life is one of the liberties that has been protected by the due process clause of the 14th amendment so america is very clear about it you know there are plethora of judgment from the us which speaks about this particular concept very vehemently now um, again i wish to again i would reiterate the very fact that probably our understanding of the concept of marriage as i said in india is simply a, a sort of a, a, a timely uh, happening thing that's it see your i wish to uh, you know uh, give up or give give through light on the definition by frederick william robertson who very beautifully defines marriage uh, to be a union uh, you know it's i mean it, he says that it's a union between two spirits and the intention of that bond is to perfect the nature of both by supplementing their deficiencies with the force of contract given to each sex these excellences in which naturally deficient to the one strength of character and firmness of moral will or to the other sympathy meekness tenderness and just so solemn and glorious as to those ends for which the union was intended now you might be wondering why am i going so poetic about this particular um institution why because it is indeed poetic uh, uh, as i closely read islamic jurisprudence probably that is why i keep on you know citing that because in in islam we say that marriage the moment it is not compatible with two individuals you are free to break so then i started to analyze why was in islam marriage divorce is so easy uh, for men and women and then it it came to my uh, you know understanding through the research that at any point of time if there is no uh, happy uh, union or if there is no element of bliss in the union you men and women can just exit so that is what marriage is all about unlike the so called um, formality that we have set up in india you take up the west in west marriage again is not uh, you know a sort of a formality that we have it's so open that you know it is so mm, it's so about two individuals and there is nothing to do with family class caste unlike india so here where we say that why are we having so much divorces in india unlike the west and do west do have but why the question is we never had the right person to be with that is the reason so we are always trying to you know speak about post marital rights rather than pre marital rights 
Now, again, I would like to, you know, draw your attention to certain judgments which spoke about the significance of this institution. In Harmander Kaur versus Harmander Singh Chaudhary in All India Report in 1984, it's a Delhi judgment, wherein uh, it was said by Justice Rutaki that, see, marriage is not a very casual commerce. It is, a, I mean, it's not a mere casual commerce without intention of cohabitation and bringing up of children for would not consider marriage. See, when I read this line, what I understand is, uh, I know there are, uh, you know, so many people, uh, I mean, out there, like judges over here who have been experienced in family courts. You know, many a time I have found that, see, uh, how the, the, the so-called union is so, so fragile that they, there is no element of love involved and it's just a mere contract that I can and I hardly bother to, you know, especially when it comes to maintenance cases, when there are, you know, cases badly fought, and they, they say that uh, I cannot maintain my wife, I cannot maintain uh, my children, and then they, you know, they fight it tooth and nail. I am always wondered, you know, uh, how can they just turn up, you know, so formal in such a beautiful relationship? Does a court, uh, does an external third person should decide what you have to give to your own wife or should a third party decide what your child should get see ultimately you have mistaken this particular institution so profoundly that you're not even able to understand why really this particular institution was set up so why am i going a little bit philosophical here because if this is red you know if this particular institution is uh, you know uh, seen through this lens I'm very sure that many marital disputes that we see today or the, the, you know, the piling up marital disputes that we have today can be to some extent resolved. And I'm sure like many of uh, all, all of you over here would uh, agree with what I say because ultimately it's about understanding with this particular sacrament institution in its real sense. Now, um, you know, coming as, as already um, told uh, by uh, Premadan, like regarding uh, the particular, you know, way, way back in 1928 in Hassan Kuti Berry was a we had already declared that this right of marriage to the right person of your own choice was way back decided, but, I mean, pre, pre independence time, that it, the, the judgment goes on to say that, and I quote, it is not lawful for a guardian to force into marriage an adult against her consent. So uh, it's nothing very new. You know, people might think, okay, the new so-called feminist movements have come up. You now people are speaking about, um, you know, the new West wife that has been intruding into our, uh, you know, society and norms. Not really. You know, if you read this particular judgment, you can understand we have not borrowed anything from West. This was from within us. And it is very clear. Now, um, coming into the, the the recent judgments, as well as you know, certain judgments like Lata Singh versus State of Uttar Pradesh, which has already been mentioned. You know, it has been very clearly held that you know this is a very free and democratic country. And once a person becomes major, he or she can marry whomsoever he likes. And you know, uh, and, and this particular judgment goes on to say that it directs the administration, police, or authorities throughout the country to see that if any boy or girl who is a major undergoes an intercaste or interreligious marriage to a woman or a man who is a major, the couple is, it has to be seen that they're not harassed by anyone or subjected or threats of acts of violence. So again, it comes about honor killing and that, you know, uh, there are a lot of report of judgments, you know, in the backdrop of honor killing, like Armogan Sarvai was the state of Tamil Nadu in 2011, wherein uh, Justice Mark and Dekaju, you know, gone on to speak about the Kapanjayats, how they, you know, how they just, you know, intruded into the privacy of two individuals, how they tried to institutionalize, you know, atrocities to a level, you know, where murder was spoken as honor. And, you know, Ka Justice Kaju went to say that, what honor do you see in these killing? So, you know, and then the Shakti Vahani, where we stopped with Shakti Vahani in 2018, shocking. Um, incidents that is happening in south southern part of and so shocking because it is happening uh, in southern part of the country where we believe that um, you know we are more uh, uh, you know commonsensical than the counterparts in North India but it's so shocking that it's still happening and um, 
you know it, and shakti mahani is one of the judgment you know which really takes up to the mood that we are still in that you know uh, vedic periods where caste determines my living now um, again going into uh, why tamil nadu we had uh, the famous hadia case um, to the nail fought media celebrated uh, and supreme court even went to an extent to order uh, nia uh, investigation against shafin jahan and oh my god the drama that the drama that held throughout this judgment and i personally witnessed uh, i was in the courtroom uh when uh, chief justice uh, deepak mishra was asking and the, and the final uh, uh, hadia uh, that um, uh, do you want what do you want uh, hadia then then the, you know that women were so trembled poor women you know she was like uh, what mistake did she do the only mistake she did was she loved a person out of her religion but religion is irrelevant because before marriage uh to you know before marrying to shafin she had converted to islam she understood the tenets of this religion she had converted so you know again the question that comes again is does somebody like state or the organs of the state should decide uh where and how should i live whom should i marry and who should i love this question you know i mean that entire ambience when when we were all, all were sitting in the court number 1 of the supreme court we were like you know ourselves asking this question time and again you know uh, seeing that poor she was victimized for being uh, you know um choosing her own life so this is a scenario of this particular um country that we we live in and the so called largest democracy now again going through uh, asha ranjan versus state of bihar uh, very clearly supreme court in 2017 held that choice of a woman in choosing her partner in a life is a legitimate constitutional right it is founded on individual choice that has been recognized in the constitution under article 19 and you know all this you know concept called class honor group thinking everything you know it just takes away the very spirit that the constitutional makers had to build up a pluralistic country now it is because of that we ended up with the 242nd uh, law commission report exclusively dealing on prevention of interference i just like the title you know prevention of interference with the freedom of matrimonial alliances in the name of honor and tradition just imagine that we had such a lengthy title and uh, and uh, and it means a lot It, it is about interference. It, it's about freedom of matrimonial alliances. It's about honor. It's about tradition. We are attacking everything through that title. And uh, you know, um, this particular law commission report, you know, even you know, took a, a very, uh, you know, what to say, a laborious effort to bring out a bill wherein it, it said that it, 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 it unwarrantedly, you know, wanted to check. The interference of those assemblies, like panchayats, uh, you know, and all those. Uh, all those you know uh, alternative mechanism that is so patriarchal uh, in its nature and it was even endangering the life of individual taking right uh, you know the very right to life of you know individuals who intended to marry from uh, you know different religion and caste now uh, i would like to you know uh, this is the backdrop you know and uh, today as i said and i am again reiterating i'm happy that i'm in kerala and i'm saying about a very very fancy ordinance that it came you know across uh, recently that is a up prohibition of unlawful conversion of religion uh, ordinance 2020 now the very title is very shocking for me unlawful conversion before you jump into what sort of a conversion the state has declared it's unlawful i really don't understand the fancy full word that been used unlawful now uh, i would like to you know read the preamble it says that it is to provide for prohibition of unlawful conversion from one religion to another by misrepresentation force undue influence coercion allurement or by marriage and for the matters connected there with or incidental there to now i would love to hear a lot of things like misrepresentation for okay fine but what is marriage to do with your this is a question that needs to be answered because as i already explained and i'm i'm trying to prove again the state has no business in my marriage because it is about two individuals now why is the state so you know acting so like a what to say a big brother to me is a question that i have 
Now I want to go into the nuances of this ordinance. Why? Because the audience here should understand how ill-minded the legislature was when it drafted this sort of an ordinance in a hurry manner. And I would take all of you, uh, maybe hardly, uh, you know, a couple of minutes. I mean, uh, I would just draw a couple of minutes to give. I'm going to try to break this particular ordinance for your, uh, you know, for the audience. Now, I would like to take you into the section three of this particular ordinance, which says that no person shall convert or attempt to convert. See the wordings, how violent the wordings even are. No person shall convert or even attempt to convert as if it's a threat to me. And it's actually the state is threatening me. Like you are not supposed to convert. Now the question is, for instance, I will tell you, if a Hindu man wants to marry a practicing Muslim woman, as per Sharia, he will have to convert to Islam as the Quranic injunction prohibits her to marry an idolater. Now my question to the UP government is, like how can you even threaten a person who, by a particular personal law, can never ever marry that another individual because there is a personal law in hindrance. So this is a larger question that needs to be unpacked. Now, what is more problematic, I would like to take you to as a section five, which creates this as an offense, uh, uh, which creates that this is an offense. Now coming to the very understanding of offense. An offense... And this particular offense is, I mean, it's been categorized into three. For your convenience, I'm going to tell you the three categories, how this is becoming an offense. First of all, the first lab is an offense that is punishable not less than one year and may extend to five years and fine shall not be less than 15,000. This is the first lab. Now, the second lab is very scary. If this particular, you know, as the proviso goes on to say that, if you are contravened in respect to a minor, a woman, or a person who belongs to SAST, you have to be very cautious because the imprisonment shall not be less than two years and shall not, you know, and the punishment and the fine shall not be less than 25,000. Imagine. So this sort of, you know, the third slab even goes to say about mass conversions wherein the punishment extends to even 10 years. So this sort of over-criminalization is a dangerous step and it gives a clear signal of dictatorship. Now, my query, and I have people like uh, Ral sir all sitting here to answer my query is, what guilty intention or ill intention do one have if she or he converts to a faith of her own choice to live with a person whom she or he loves? This over-criminalization needs to be answered by the criminal law experts while dealing with this ordinance. Now going to the interesting part is the compensatory jurisprudence that has been inserted in this ordinance. And that to an amount of at least 5 lakhs. Oh my God. In UP, you can see what really the scenario is. Brutal rapes, brutal gang rapes happen and uh, being in the ground uh, as a prosecutor in the Mahila court, uh, I really don't know how far this compensatory jurisprudence really works in that part of the area where I work. Now, um, coming into the, uh, as Premedan told about, is a burden of, you know, shift that has uh, happened here. Uh, and that is the most fanciful thing that I found in this, uh, you know, and most chilling also, where it, um, it says that um, it, it creates a lot of pandemonium to the, you know, crypto law researchers also, because this particular, um, you know, what to say, with what sense have they, you know, shifted the accusatorial justice system that we follow to that in this particular law. Now, again, there are more strange things I would like to take you, uh, especially for criminal law, you know, researcher, this particular ordinance is a piece to, you know, do a postmortem with. Uh, now, it goes on to say that, uh, if this particular person accused is previously convicted of an offence under this ordinance, shall be liable for every such subsequent offence to a punishment not exceeding double the punishment. Now, again, which is a very uh, a newer uh, thought of you know punishment that has been introduced through this ordinance, and uh, at the same time, uh, how Section Seven is uh, saying like it's cognizable and non-bailable and triable by court of sessions. 
this is more interesting. Uh, what sort of a grave crime it is that it has to be tried by the code of sessions. Now, um, another important thing that, you know, that is really shocking is the section six, wherein the section six says that the marriage will be declared void by the family court, irrespective of the fact that the two adults consulted to live together. So why? Why? How can the family court just declare uh, through a legislation a particular marriage, which is totally constitutional, to be void? Anyways, the matter has been challenged and, you know, let's see like where till where we can take it up. Now, you know, what I wish to say at this point is that this ordinance is not merely legal. It violates the very foundation of the constitution. You know, in fact, you know, when you're introducing such sort of a legislation, it provides strong evidence that while the constitution may stay, you have a very brilliant constitution there, but its core values and principles are so dismantled and replaced. And, you know, I would have to, you know, very saddeningly say that we have crossed all limits of this whole of legislative decency and propriety with this promulgation of ordinance. Now, um, you know, interestingly, uh, you know, while I was researching on this topic, uh, I, I can take the audience to a very parallel uh, thing, you know, uh, history uh, where this ordinance, you know, perhaps it's, you know, it's, uh, it's parallel black Nuremberg laws of 1935, which was brought by the Nazi Germany against the Jews, Romans, and the minorities at that point of time. And a little out of, you know, uh, I mean, the history needs to be read, you know, the problem is that we don't read history the way it has to be read. You know, I'm going to take you all to um, the love story of, uh, you know, August Land Metzer. He was a member of the Nazi party. He, uh, unfortunately for him, he fell in love with Irma Eckler, a Jewish woman. Now, um, you know, what happened? The tragedy was that Lan Menso was expelled from the Nazi party. He was arrested. And at the same time, their marriage was made illegal according to the Black Nuremberg laws of 1935. Now, I put to the wisdom of the audience who are listening to me, don't you think this is so in coincidence with the current UP ordinance, which is trying to bring out a certain set of things to happen in a certain way, the agenda or whatever it is, but unfortunately playing with the constitutional values that we cherish. Now, um, as a tight slap, soon after this particular ordinance, Karnataka High Court, along with Allahabad High Court, uh, that is especially the Karnataka High Court in Vajit Khan versus Commission Police, recently, you know, as a you know as a as a tight uh, you know response to this particular ordinance, held that the right of an individual to marry any person of his or own choice, irrespective of caste or religion, is a fundamental right that has been enshrined in the Constitution of India. And the Karnataka, you know, High Court, you know, reaffirmed the uh, the uh, release of a woman in the habeas corpus petition that has been uh, filed by her. Now, what we have to see today is that, uh, see, uh, in uh, what the bench of, you know, had said that the liberty to, you know, personal relationship to individuals cannot be encroached by anybody. That is a very clear, uh, uh, you know, take that Karnataka High Court had to, you know, uh, take. Well, uh, what would I would, you know, go on to say is that, unfortunately, we have moved away from the very spirits that the constitutional makers had said. Um, just, uh, just a second, I need. So you are on mute. Muted. Yeah. I'm, yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm really sorry. Okay, so uh, with reading this uh, UP ordinance, what we really, what really reflects is that are we really eroding the very constitutional value? Now I put it across to the audience to say, uh, to take their own stance on this particular issue. Now another important element is not about heterosexual marriages. Now I'm going to give you another take that is same-sex marriage, uh, which uh, unfortunately India has yet to legalize. 
but there has been uh, a couple of petitions before the delhi high court and the kerala high court which has now you know ceased with this issue regarding the validity of same sex marriage so there are as i said there are batch of petition that has been contending that homosexual sex has been decriminalized by the apex court but the same sex marriage is still not allowed under the provisions of hindu marriage act 1956 and the special marriage act of 1954 well uh, when this matter came before the delhi high court the petitioner contended that the hindu marriage act 1956 does not distinguish between a heterosexual and a homosexual in terms of marriage see uh, if you closely look into the wordings of section 5 it says that the marriage can indeed be solemnized within two hindus making that particular law very gender neutral so in response to unfortunately in response to that petition as premeden already said the solicitor general uh, you know gave up his uh, gave, gave out his personal stand saying that the indian values doesn't recognize uh, same sex unions a little strange you know for him to say that now at the same time uh, even the kerala high court uh, the, the recently and uh, not recently january 2020 the petition uh, a petition was moved uh, you know by two male uh, ad, uh, you know male who had married uh, married but then unfortunately they could not get their marriage registered under the special marriage act and um, you know they were contending that the special marriage act of 1954 allows for marriages between individuals from different religions and castes while no separate definition of marriage is given but the act is so heterosexist are uh, having I mean the act is having so much of heterosexist underpinnings that you know the definition itself you know it is a prohibited relationship which only considered between a man and a woman with a certain degree of familial relationships so uh, so this particular law is very clear about a particular narrative called heterosexuality and then just forgetting about homosexuality so here uh, and i'm just really waiting uh, for uh, you know the the i mean the matter is pending before the kerala high court now i would you know the petitioner had you know um i have gone even to argue that this restriction to marry for uh, you know homosexual couples you know it's a sort of a violation to their expression under article 19 class 1a uh, you know and at the same time article 14 15 class 1 19 class 1a and 21 so the matter is pending and i'm really you know awaiting what sort of an arguments uh, would be really put to, put across by you know the councils for this matter so uh, you know this uh, what it ends up to say that this non recognition of marriage between the lgbts uh, you know it it is squarely violating the fundamental rights of liberty equality life and freedom of expression that is being you know granted by our uh, supreme court in navjit singh johar uh, and at the same time uh, you know the way that particular judgment you know has thrown light uh, the importance of sexual orientation and you know the way you know it, it you know it went on to speak about sexual autonomy in in breadth and length and at the same time we have uh, you know the national legal services authority versus union of india 2014 5 acc 438 a breath back you know an, an amazing judgment which has even given recognition of transgender as a third gender uh, making it very clear that the word person in article 14 does not you know restrict the word person and it didn't apply not only it applies to male and female you know it even you know wonderful judgment um, it goes to say that self discrimination determination of gender self determination of gender um, is an integral part of personal autonomy and uh, and self expression and it uh, falls within the realm of personal liberty that has been guaranteed under article 21 of the constitution now uh, and in this juncture i cannot miss to you know a uh, quote the the amazing judgment of justice putu swami versus union of india as already i've heard uh, you know and as like uh, this is uh, ram kumar sir has already told the judge told the judgment is so so was we are yet to decode it but um uh, diva chandra chud being one of my favorite uh, judge uh, i would i i really love to you know read around him and i'm just taking a bit what he have, you know he spoke through this judgment wherein he goes to say you know quoting the judgment of usa in planned parenthood versus casse but he says that our precedents have respected um the private realm of family life 
which the state cannot enter. This is one of the most, um, you know, interesting quote that I found, you know, uh, wherein, you know, uh, this, this goes to say that these matters involving the most intimate and personal choices a person may make in a lifetime. That is very important. This is a very important decision that a person makes in a lifetime. Uh, the choices that are central to personal dignity and autonomy are central to the liberty that has been protected by the 14th Amendment. So at the heart of liberty is the right to define one's own concept of existence, of meaning of the universe and of the mystery of human life. So, you know, amazing, you know, it's such a philosophical angle it goes on to say that, and it, it tells that privacy recognizes the autonomy of the individual and the right of every person to make essential choices which affect the course of life. So in doing so, privacy recognizes that living of life of a dignity is essential for a human being to fulfill the liberties and freedoms which are the cornerstone of the constitution. Now, at the same time, uh, DYC goes on to, just as DYC goes on to say that the decision of South African Supreme Court and Bernstein versus Bester where it goes on to define the meaning of autonomy and says that autonomy must mean far more than the right to occupy an envelope of space in which a socially detached individual can act freely from interference by the state. So what is the crucial is the nature of the activity, nor its site. So while recognizing the unique worth of each person, the constitution does not presuppose that a holder of right is an isolated, lonely, and abstract figure possessing a disembodied and socially disconnected life. It acknowledges that people live in their own bodies, their communities, their cultures, their spaces, places, and their times. So it is not for the state, this is very important to say that, it is not for the state to choose or to arrange the choice of partner, but for the partners to choose themselves. So um, again, what it again reiterates is that the decisional autonomy includes personal intimacies, the sanctity of family life, marriage, procreation, the home, sexual orientation, all thanks to Justice Kim, that amazing judgment uh, which, you know, went through. So I'm not, you know, going into more length uh, because this is more about, you know, perceptions. It's more about uh, your, um, you know, thoughts about this particular subject because it's a very uh, you know personal subject to everybody so i'm leaving it to the participants you know to ponder on but again you know uh, as a you know as a uh, uh, as an end note i would say that as long as we have the nayar matrimony irava matrimony muslim matrimony christian matrimony sites um, you know to satisfy our caste religion and class criteria in marriage See, I would really say all these discussions that we're going to do here is going to be mere time pass. So now I'm leaving it to the audience to, you know, take a call on my thoughts. Yes. I would say that uh, before going further, let us hear the concluding remarks from Justice Ram Kumar, sir. Thank you, Shyam. Stunning catalog of the laws and case laws by the introducer Premraj Menon and excellent articulation by Nima Noor on the topic. Only thing is the mannerism you know I could count up to 313. <laughs> now let me come to choice in marriage. Wonderful topic also. The word marriage is derived from old French word marrier, meaning to marry. Marriage is the Latin derivative of the word maritare, meaning to provide with a husband or wife. And maritari means to get married. Marriage, which is also called matrimony or wedlock, is understood as a, as a culturally recognized union between parties, conceptually the opposite sex, of the opposite sex. Like I have heard a judges uh, writing judgment saying that so-and-so got married and a child was born out of wedlock. Ch if a child was born out of wedlock, then it is illegitimate. 
I was read the judgments uh, reading, uh, taking such views. Then marriage establishes certain rights and obligations, inter se between the spouses, between them and their children, or between them and their in-laws. We have traveled a lot from polygamy through polyandry, polygyny to monogamy. Finally, the Pristine concept of Swayamvara among Hindus, wherein the bride chooses a man of her choice to be her life's partner, has metamorphosed into its rudimentary or symbolic form nowadays, depicting the bride first garlanding the groom and the latter performing the very same ritual subsequently in point of time. This is, this is what is visible of Swayamvara nowadays. Likewise, the custom of tying the thali by the groom around the neck of the bride has received so much universality as depicting marriage that even among the members of the Nair community, the ritual of the presentation of Pudava by the groom to the bride as constituting the customary marriage, form of marriage is slowly receding to the background. See, in ancient Nair families, the consent of the groom or the bride was hardly taken for marriage. The Tarwad Karnavan, who was usually the eldest maternal uncle, would uh, only direct the boy concerned to give a Pudava to a chosen girl, usually his own daughter. Once that is uh, accomplished, marriage is over. Nothing more, nothing less. So that is the marriage among Nair community. There is no tying of Thali, no Saptabadi, etc. All those things are alien to Nair marriage. There is only the presentation of the cloth, namely Pudava. Tying of the Thali or taking seven steps around the sacred fire, etc. were not the inevitable custom for the, complete, for the completion of marriage. History has witnessed the degradation of women into a chattel liable to be sold or tortured as if she is a slave. It is high time that the Mohammedan custom of the bride's father on behalf of the adult daughter entering into contract of matrimony with the groom was dispensed with. The consent for the marriage should come from the bride herself who has attained majority and has completed the age of contract and not from her father. Similarly, even though the act of a Muslim male contracting a second marriage may not amount to the criminal offense of bigamy, punishable under Section 494 of the Indian Penal Code, unless, of course, he foolishly embraces another religion. <laughs> the, 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 if he is a government servant, rules do not allow him to enjoy the conjugal quadrangle allowed by the personal law. If I, I am not mistaken, it is Rule 93 of the Government Servants Conduct Rules. The concept of marriage itself hitherto applied in gender binary world needs to be redefined in the context of the emergent, emergence of homosexuals, transgenders, cisgenders, and androgynous and or hemi hermaphrodites, transvestism, all these uh, you know, uh, manifestations. If, a, if an ostensible man or woman derives the pleasure of marriage in the company of his own or her own self, can the law deny them any claim of marriage, claim for marriage? It may come to that level that I will allow to marry myself or some girl may love to marry herself, you, particularly if she or he is hermaphrodite. The verdict of decriminalization of Section 377 of the Indian Penal Code also has its own impact on such claims. Rights such as sexual monopoly, domestic and other labor services, procreation of children, and other ancillary claims and obligations mutually enjoyed by the marital partners are slowly becoming evanescent attributes of marriage. 
inter caste marriages are generally are slowly slowly gaining acceptance due to increase in education employment middle class economic background and urbanization even though the national average of inter caste marriage is below 6% Mizoram has the highest number of inter caste marriages in India with 55% and Madhya Pradesh with the lowest number of inter caste marriages at about 1%. Inter caste marriages virtually paved the way for refinement in progeny thereby reinforcing Mendel's law of cross pollination. It is disconcerting to note that the state of Uttar Pradesh had played a proactive role in the matter of inter caste marriage by offering cash awards for inter caste couple and thereby promoting such inter caste marriages long back it has now recently enacted a law discouraging marriage from outside the religion it's a very very uh, retrograde step taken by up which had championed the cause of uh, inter caste marriages this is uh, especially in the context of special marriage act special marriage act of 1954 is mainly intended for such uh, marriages on the judicial side also both, both the speakers mentioned about letha singh ar 19 2000 ar 2006 supreme court 2522 it's a silver line in the matter of promoting inter caste marriages the apex court had also deprecated honor killings as a result of inter caste marriages even though caste and religion are conveniently given only secondary or no importance when it comes to inter caste marriages the fact remains that caste and religion are very often uppermost if one were to browse through the matrimonial columns in the in every daily newspapers people will, will say we have no no caste no bar religion no bar But just peruse the matrimonial columns you will find the relevance of caste and the i am reminded of a human right activist judge who was deadly against the police indulging in third degree methods for extracting confessions what happened was a burglary took place in the judge's house from where precious jewelry had been stolen a crime was registered and the investigating police officer one day approached the judge with the alleged in the company of the alleged thief the officer told the judge that he could extract a confession and recover the entire stolen property only if he was permitted to resort to corporal means the judge had no disagreement to the course suggested by him mind you he was a <laughs> human rights activist judge this is our attitude towards such public policy when it comes to our own personal comforts we are prepared to sacrifice all our ideologies and uh, many of the um, laws are more honored in their breach than observance even in the case of nayars i have heard that after the the formal marriage by a nayar he the most mostly the married woman was a concubine of nambudiris only to free to occasionally visited by her nair husband this was the, and uh, um, it was the nambudiris who brought in the the marimak time law so that if it, if there is any progeny born he or she will be referred to the mother not to the father <laughs> this is what i have heard from my elders i don't know how far it is true a anyway, wonderful articulation thank you sp ramushan was uh, ramushan sir was here uh, i'm not very tungi poya adi poya jayan like jayan <laughs> oh, sure. uh, sir i i'll do one thing uh, 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 as and when he joins we'll get his comments okay, um, okay. Uh, maybe maybe he's on his way to quarters he was in the yeah, office maybe room. from the office he was the office correct correct i think i'll go directly to vijay vijay can you unmute yeah please yeah 
was just following sister nascent law is so new that the somebody's rights to get married are being restricted nowadays we are seeing a new trend now <laughs> i can only say that uh, how far this will hold what is chances are very limited Maybe it suits more the uh, the voting public or the keeping that in mind these legislations are being passed we don't uh, i find it really amusing that these kind of laws are being passed and uh, neema and uh, she she was on a uh, i mean reeling out the case laws on this particular subject and very nice very nice offer to talk at length about this particular subject i am at a different place not in hello i had connectivity issues last week so i put the log thank you thank you thank you thank you i could count uh, i could count up to i could count up to 300 you know <laughs> uh, sir uh, that's the issue i mean uh, something good about neema is that she presumes that we know everything so that's why she <laughs> says that you know you know anyway we'll go to kevj rao sir good evening everybody i am actually breaking the taboo of my fraternity that is we don't discuss religion that is the first <laughs> that is the first thing that my my job entails anyway coming to this topic uh i i broke the tradition in my family so i can speak ah, uh, no wonder <laughs> i can speak loudly i'm i'm a andhraid married to a maharashtrian uh, who was one year junior to me more educated than me so i am proud uh, she runs the family she does everything for me so that's another issue the problem basically is like if you look back at history if there was no religion there was no problem in marriage it's when the religions came in that the problems for the marriages or the compatibility of people to marry slowly set into the system like as as miss noor mentioned in one of her speeches that the muslim law the sharia law itself prohibits her from marrying an idolater now if that taboo exists then an inter religion uh, or inter faith marriage would be uh, what would i say on the wrong path from the beginning itself you see because if you cannot accept the other person's faith then it very becomes very difficult to cohabit it that's that's how we need to look at look at a lot of things compromise is possible yes comp- yeah, your your honor compromise is possible but if i start with the fundamental that my religion does not allow believe or allow me to believe in an idol later than that that there would be no compromise in that marriage is 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 not a bed of roses which we all agree whether of course, it's com- compromising that, positions cannot be the compromise sir I, i i i i would not want to get into that sphere sir but like i said i come from a field where whether you talk about lgbt or inter caste religions or inter religion marriages uh, marriages has been a a trend because uh, in my uh, community uh, which is the aviation industry the fraternal uh, you, you move with so many kind of religion so many kind of people so many classes of people so and you're away from home there are a lot of bondings that take place and that do get converted into marriages having said that in the beginning everything is hunky dory till the children are born then the naming the naming ceremony of the children becomes a big fundamental issue then the education then what is the religion that the children are going to follow these are all issues that crop up which are not thought of at the beginning of the relationship and they really spoil or uh, should i say lead lead to a lot of friction in in an intercaste marriage i totally agree that it is not none of the state's business to be in the business of marriage just as it's not the business of the state to be in business i do agree that it's not the state of, uh, state of the uh, it's not the business of the state to be in marriage but unfortunately we have come so far away from from the equilibrium uh, like uh, uh miss noor will agree with me that in the muslim community the marriage is a contract in the hindu community it was never accepted as a contract 
But unfortunately, unfortunately, just a month back, Mr. Mohan Bhagwat said it is an unwritten contract, which which I totally disagree with him. You see, ultimately, what happens is the the makers of the rule. It is their mindset that we ne- literally need to break to get a law or a good law into place. And like the caste system, as Justice Ram Kumar said, Uttar Pradesh, the North has always been maintaining that uh, the uh, caste system. I mean, they would never breach it. It is more like if you see if, the, if there is an understanding or growing of understanding of religions has always been in the South. Like if you uh, you take Kerala itself, the first mosque in India was built in Kerala. You see, the the mindset at that point of time was an open mindset that they allowed any and every religion to grow, as long as they did not interfere in in their uh, system. But then, over a period of time, we had to merge because you would not be able to run a parallel system for a long time. And having said that, and the judgments, like I said, I I am an aviation expert. My my field of law. Uh, understanding is much but like i said because i have broken the taboo 40 years back so i know what i know what i'm talking about and those were the time it was really difficult to even convince anybody that you wanted to marry somebody out of your own caste and I, and especially me coming from the highest brahman family in the andhra uh, system so that was another uh, taboo it took me 11 years to convince my parents that you know I'm, i would like to marry this girl so having said that i mean it's a very good topic and i i totally agree that the choice of of my partner should remain with me because especially in india marriage basically today because of the nuclear family we are not looking at it but earlier when you got married you literally got married into the family none of you could could get out of the family you you had to take the whole family along with you and it couldn't be your own individual choice so having said that i totally agree that the state should stay out of the business of marriage thank you very much shyam sir see for lovers at the infatuation level caste religion etc are totally foreign sir, sir sometimes level, it is not infatuation that, sir some like you know you, you grow see, together it all it all starts with infatuation only okay sir and i <laughs> <laughs> i leave it to to your wiser counsel i've got nothing to say on that no, i am not an experienced man in this field but mm. still <laughs> you know, like i have no, seen men and matters you know yes sir i like i have seen a lot of it so i know where i'm coming from sir basically my field is such my or rather my field has been such that there have been a lot of intercaste interreligion marriages that we've seen i mean they some are some are examples some are not but then same thing happens in the like i'm not uh, uh, putting it into a particular religion it happens even amongst the hindus or whatever but the fact remains is ultimately marriage is a choice between two individuals whether state state need not get into the the business of right. marriage period exactly. that's all sir thank you very much sir thank you thank you rao sir uh, we had uh, rigu kumar sir is he yeah so you let to unmute Yeah, I have nothing to add. Last week, my son was telling, in his class, on the right side is an Andhra girl, and left side is a Maharashtra girl. He is in a dilemma. Who to choose between? No, I said, don't spoil the opportunity of a Malayali girl. <laughs> oh, very good. Very good. <laughs> Sir, um. regarding uh one question that has come up no that has been deleted now okay uh anyone else to put the questions i don't think uh, there are any uh, so i think uh, let's go for the concluding remarks and uh, person who introduced please prem well nimo i i tell you it was an exceptionally beautiful articulation on this topic because you have left absolutely no stones unturned and you were quoting even the us and south african supreme court judgment apart from the indian judgment extended it is 
in my estimation it was absolutely erudite and enlightening thank you so much correct she disappeared has she disappeared no no she is she is she is showered with encomium so that so that she is unable to speak um no, i was just i mean waiting for you know neema don't don't that uh, please take take my observation in a lighter way <laughs> regarding the mannerism <laughs> no offense meant no no sir i am absolutely fine <laughs> <laughs> thank you <laughs> Uh, as we come to the end of the session, a uh, couple of questions that has been thrown up is that uh, are we uh, to blindly follow the West and have our social fabric uh, disintegrated, or are we to uh, are we to be uh, what do you call nomenclature as uh, oldies or uh, uh, what do you call uh, persons uh, of, of not the Oyo category of the present category, where in uh, marriage and I was should be seen in the same category with no state intervention because. Uh, uh, i believe and maybe many of us believe that uh, uh, for an orderly society the basic is just like a human being the uh, cell is the basic thing like any other object atom is the basic thing like i believe in any orderly society uh, it is the family that's the basic unit unless and until its, its sanctity whatever uh, philosophy whatever um, uh, legal uh, maxims we may quote unless and until it may be able to be preserved uh, the system as we see may disintegrate maybe a change for the better with this open thoughts and i i i am sure that i can speak uh, loudly about this because uh, inter religious marriage i am not new to it <laughs> at least uh, i have 25 years of experience in it in the sense like not that 25 years of uh, continuous marriage only one marriage but still <laughs> 25 years uh, so i said that uh, all said and done it's a contract between you and the state because uh, we live in a state so our obligations toward the state at times maybe whatever name you may give it it's human rights so for the human race to survive and for a nation to be stable maybe at times certain ideas uh, uh, which we may borrow from the west may have to be diluted to a certain extent i believe i don't know but uh, we'll keep the debate open because uh, this is just uh, introducing the topic in the sense like on a wonderful day just after the human rights day and that uh, uh, i will said yeah uh, shamit i will tell you one thing because that question who has put that question Who dance? No, no. I only said that. Oh. Yeah, I'm just airing a couple of questions. Not that anybody put the question. Okay, okay. See, let me just tell you one thing. See, if somebody asks you, which is the most famous case in the history of our constitution? Obviously, the answer is Case of Anand Bharati, right? Mm -hmm. If you read Case of Anand Bharati as a whole, you can see. If you read the judgment as a whole. what was the prime argument which was advanced by none other than the great nani parikwal you can see he goes on to argue not merely on article 13 that fundamental rights are based only on article 13 and it has to pass the muster now you can see he goes on to argue that the entire part 3 they are based on the universal declaration of human rights which are natural rights and therefore they were not within the scope of the amendment you kindly refer to paragraph number 2176 of the judgment 2176 wherein the supreme court holds that the essential features of the constitution are basic human rights which are described as natural rights which correspond to the rights which are enumerated in the universal declaration of human rights to which india is a signatory then another beautiful judgment you have in ram jiyo chauhan 2010 cc 209 see you have two other judgments one is that navteej singh johar 2018 cc page 1 which was cited by neema and the justice putra swami the right to privacy judgment 2017 cc page 1 and you just uh, if you evaluate or if you go and uh, get that judgments you can see what exactly is human rights now we have a human rights act what exactly does section 21 clause d define human rights it means the rights which relate to life liberty just see the words equality and dignity of the individual which is guaranteed by the constitution or embodied in the international covenant and enforceable in courts you see the definition in 21d 
See, this is an act which came during 1993. And kindly see, we have an international covenant on the civil and political rights, which was adopted on 16th of December 1979, despite that having come uh, long back during 23rd of March 1976. And India got it ratified only during 11th of December 1977. And thereafter, you can read this Human Rights, the Protection of Human Rights Act, along with the judgment in Kesavan and the Bharati, along with the judgment in the Right to Privacy Judgment, along with the judgment in Navtej Singh, and along with this uh, Ramdeo Chauhan's case. And please see what exactly was it, uh, Article 242, I mean, uh, the 242nd uh, Law Commission report. If you read that Law Commission report, because that particular Law Commission report that has been titled as the Prohibition of Interference with the Freedom of Matrimonial Alliances Bill. Who was the chairman, Travis? Who was the chairman? Mm, I don't I, I, It was... Uh, so one ready. ready. Okay. Uh, Jack one ready, maybe. One uh, no, no, I'm sorry. Be, uh, BP ready or something. Oh, yeah, I'll just get I think it is the ninth, right? Ninth law commission. Now, if you go and read this particular 242nd report, it makes clear, see, we had honor kit, which we say as honor crimes. This was never peculiar to our country at first. Now, isn't this an evil which would harm the society? See, what exactly is the disrepute or the dishonor which the particular victim, what exactly is the dishonor or disrepute he has caused? See, it is not only the women, even the males, they are also targeted. No, Prem, the issue was not that. The issue was whether uh, it can be stated or nomenclature or described as freedom and uh, an exercise of human rights uh, that Anytime you want to marry, uh, sorry, anytime you want to divorce, ease of divorce is something was equated to uh, a fundamental, what do you call, uh, human right. It is just like saying hire and fire uh, uh, policy of a management if they have some sort of human rights. Here, here you have to take note of the two judgments which were cited by Nima. One is that Planned Parenthood, which is a 1992 decision by the US Supreme Court. And the second one, that of the South African Supreme Court, in the Bernstein versus Bester, it's a 1996 judgment. Please see the words she, she has quoted. It is not for the state to choose or to arrange the choice of a partner, but for the partners to choose themselves. So if you want to marry, you can marry. If you want to divorce, if you are not comfortable, you cannot. Of course. See, that is what is decisional autonomy. What is decisional autonomy? See, decisional autonomy means Decisional autonomy, as of now, we say it is recognized as a dim of Article 21 by means of the right to privacy judgment. And what exactly is Article 21? See, Article 21 means it should be quite life should be quite meaningful. Why? Without a meaningful life, can you merely say you have only a right to life, but you don't have a right to meaningful life? And kindly see the judgment in uh, Shafir Jahan's case. Even though it doesn't speak of divorce. Because our constitution guarantees, see, this is the most important article is Article 21. Now you can see this particular right, you cannot take away those rights. Because liberty, which the constitution guarantees as a fundamental right means, it is an ability for each and every individual to take decisions on the matters central to the pursuit of his or her happiness. There again, like all other uh, rights, there should be some sort of reasonable restriction might have been the thought that has been there. Now let us just, uh, for a second, for a second, Prem, Prem, one second. Let us hear the comments of Ramushan, sir, now that he's here. Justice Ramushan, sir. <laughs> Matrimonial uh, freedom. Uh, Matrimonial freedom. See, in olden days, there was no difficulty to choose your partner, live with them, adjust with them till the death. That is now, true. such a concept, such a concept has been given a go-by. And everybody thinks, because I do not want to say the, the system has come to such an extent, 
that if you want you can choose a person even with that marriage you can live together and live whenever you want to go out so you have, the society or the culture has gone to that extent in that in that way if you think uh, the what noor uh, nima and prem were arguing for could have been welcome but the first time see why such things have been mooted for the purpose of restricting the conversion etc etc is also a matter to be gone into I mean, the background on which it has been seen in kerala love jihad was raised as one of the reason for the forceful conversion for the purpose of sake of marriage for the purpose of doing human trafficking to involve them in terrorism that is a that is a concept where because i think that in one of the cases the just sangaran has had to write a judgment on that sharan not Shansky. only huh? oh, whatever it is, I, i'm not no then thereafter even the highest police officer when he was, at the time of his retiring he did not deny the fact that such thing cannot be said to be not prevailing in kerala but there is no evidence to show that it is a love jihad so it was i can say it is a, because i am not any 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 particular religion or any particular this thing i am thinking about suppose if it has been done for the purpose of a bona fide conversion with voluntariness for the purpose of confessing to that profession with the, the religion and then lead the life no nothing wrong in it but if it has been with a hidden agenda for something else and it is being done and there after the poor lady and think about i was sitting in the uh, uh, habeas bar for jurisdiction for 6 months or so along with uh, justice rahim and also for some time with the shafiq and also with uh, what you call uh, joseph sir see what is the age group of the persons who are coming on the verge of attaining majority without completing their education and they are coming with a, saying that i am i have attained majority so i i had the freedom to choose any person without having any qualification without having any wherewithal to maintain the family etc etc so and the, also the classification from the the, the stra- social strata between the boy and the girl not only in one community in all community this came when such things are to be evaluated whether the person who is trying to choose such a decision love has... is blind <laughs> i do not know <laughs> so for the first time against conversion a legislation was taken by the madras the madras government under the jailalda regime and that was stressed the constitutional validity and it has been upheld also stating that what is being restricted by that act is only a forceful conversion and not all voluntary conversions see every religious denomination had a feeling where who were involved in a conversion of one sect to one one, one religion to another religion we are under the apprehension that is that, that is likely to affect their right of uh, getting persons for their religion or the right to choose the uh, prof- the religious profession the profess is being affected on account of that when they talk to the chief minister chief minister says i am not against conversion i am only against forceful conversion if you are not doing forceful conversion why do you worry about it then everybody uh, thought that why should there is nothing against it so voluntarily coming you can have it so that is the reason why the supreme court also Uh, said sub supreme court in one of the cases if i remember correct they said for the purpose of marriage because one case i think that for the purpose of getting four four ladies to be married because that for freedom was given in uh, quran or what do you call so called quran for the holy quran which permits four marriages and a particular community he want to convert that because he has already already having a wife he see he converted into islam to get a marriage that was prevented by the supreme court saying that no no for that purpose you cannot go for that because you have got already having a marriage so it will amount to bigamy sometimes so that was the you lot to con- consider the bona fides on the part of the persons who are professing or supposed to profess or uh, select to profess that, that because it is very difficult to go into these areas because we cannot go into the devil's minds as to whether that is bona fide or bona fide or what is the purpose for it is being done etc wider concept we will have to agree with because everybody has got a right to choose Whom, whom, with whom I will have to live. Why the parents worried about it? If I am, if I am thrown out, I am prepared to face it. If that be the consequences. No other, because ultimately the uh, the sufferer is the parents. So it is. You have to find out 
a via media for that purpose and also to think in that way if you think how far justifiable when such legislations are required for the purpose of protecting uh, unlawful i can say unlawful conversions or forceful conversion in the name of uh, conducting marriages so this is an area where i think that we will have to think about because such thing such attitude such uh, uh, thinking was not there at all earlier because earlier people were doing it conversion is being done for the purpose of conversion sake once they converted to one, one particular religion they have, uh, they adhere to those things and they are living in that way but now things are different so in that way i think that uh, everything if it is connected to human right ultimately what about the human right of a father or parents to see that my daughter's life should not be in peril everybody is thinking about the violators if you read if you go by the provisions of the uh, and also the development of human right we are only thinking about the violators protection anybody thinking about the victims protection i do not know neema may be able to answer for me if you go by the any of the judgments everybody thinking about the accused right there anybody talking about victims right no so human right protection is expected and also everybody has got a right have a uh, decent life everybody has got a right of uh, choosing their own religion for the purpose of professing and also for the purpose of even for marriage etc but all those things will have to be with a what do you call because i may not be able to say it will be restricted or not to be restricted but they left to the left to the fate of the persons who are choosing it that much only that is the way in which uh, now things are going on i am not on in favor of uh, the honor killing etc that is that will have to be banned only because some uh, higher community uh, girl has been uh, uh, he loving with uh, another uh, the lower, lower strata but I, i don't say that any lower strata are no caste discrimination at all as far as i am concerned because if that that on that ground alone it cannot be said to be uh, if that person will have to be killed because it affect the what you call the honor of the uh, uh, community to which they belong so elopers this is a, beware eh? elopers elopers beware beware <laughs> so everything left to the persons who are choosing to i i will say valayanj and then the lakshmanarayana kadu povuna samayathe endu sambhavikunnu nu aranju kondu cheyidal thettilla athre ullu that is that is my this because this area is a sensitive area where we cannot uh say anything because you will have to think about the feeling of a, because earlier you got lot of people uh, children one goes nobody works about because sometimes people used to say the father may not be knowing about how many children are there in which class the uh, the child was really studying whether he has passed the class or not class etc only at the time when he comes for getting the signature of the father in the progress card then only oh exactly so how, how, how many he will be knowing sir how many huh? he will be knowing how many huh? he will be knowing how many <laughs> he will be knowing <laughs> uh, so class exam now now the, now the now the now the entire when it comes to the nuclear family and also small family all these things are more sensitive area where we have to think about on both sides when we are making some comments or something else say that everything is right everything is protected everything in article 21 article everything under article 14 all, all those things so i think that it is area where we will have to think in a different way and a different situation on case to case basis that is my opinion on that a garnavan a garnavan was inspecting the kitchen of the ancestral home so many children were being fed one boy was having a heap of rice and he he revolted who who gave him this much right and the sister said attend the mona so then it is okay <laughs> okay neema please yes, yes. Uh, frame frame neema would like pv ready eh? pv ready pv which ready which which ready venkatram ready venkatram okay okay we are ready we are venkatram ready ఈ వెంకటరామరెడ్డి ఈ వెంకటరామరెడ్డి 
<laughs> I, I, I'll be very cautious about that. Um, what I wish to say is that ultimately, again, I'm trying to argue one thing: that whenever you're speaking about the caste, class, religion, we forget that the union is about happiness. Have you ever asked your daughter, "Are your daughter happy?" You are asking whether your daughter, you, you just thinking that your daughter is married to a Brahmin, your your daughter is being married to your um, Dalit. No, it's irrelevant. The question Initially is. Initially happy. <laughs> I, I I I I hope I hope my father-in-law does not ask my wife, his daughter. Yeah yeah. <laughs> so ultimately that. You is hope or wish? <laughs> Both. Hope so that is what I wanted. It. Yeah yeah yeah. So Shamit and then I actually you will be crucified by the women's right organization. Absolutely absolutely. <laughs> led led by her. But not. <laughs> and Ramushri sir. Hmm. Let me just tell you one thing, because uh, the first thing which you referred was uh, the judgment in Sarla Mudgal, which is 1995 ESC 635. Suppose a Hindu he converts into a, as a Muslim. Only thing is such conversion it is not illegal. Only thing is bigamy would lie. So says the Supreme Court. Conversion is not. Now let me just directly go to another second point which you were uh, pondering about, which was. Uh, You were telling about the parental love, right? The parental love. We have Article 141 of the Constitution, which is beyond the pale of doubt that whatever the Supreme Court says, it is the law of the land. We are bound by that. After much deliberation, the case went up from Kerala, Shafiq Jahan. <laughs> This case has been headed by Chief Justice Deepak Mishra. Now, if you see. Para twenty seven and twenty eight. Just uh, go prem, and read. Prem, Para prem. That was a case where no, she was a doctorate, thirty five years old. She no, no. Let me let me the let court said you. he has got the all discretionary powers to think which is right and wrong. No, no. I am, I am taking talking about a, a, a smaller children. Absolutely. Of, or on the verge, of, on the verge of majority. Adolescent. Adolescent. A person, only a major person, can have a choice for marriage. That is number one. Now, para twenty seven of the judgment, Justice Deepak Mishra goes on to say that what is seminal is to remember the song of liberty is sung with sincerity, and the choice of an individual that is respected and confirms its esteem status as the constitution guarantees. And kindly see the next word which follows in para twenty eight. That is the reply to your question. Parental love or parental concern cannot be allowed. Cannot be allowed to fluster the right of choice of an adult to choose a man or a woman to whom he or she gets married. See the see the beauty of that sentence. Parental love or concern, of course, till the child is an adult. The moment. That assumes the character of an adult. Then that particular love or that particular concern that can never be allowed or permitted to fluster that right of choice, because right of choice is a personal right which any individual, which any citizen of India is having, which is guaranteed under Part Three. And kindly see, can Article Twenty One be suspended even during emergency? See, the founding fathers of our Constitution they had envisioned all these things long back. And the freedom of choice means see, you have a uh, the Gandhi scheme, which dates back to 1976. At that point of time, when an individual is over 18 years, no factors can be placed on the choice of that particular person, which was again followed in the Sony Gary's case by his Lord Chief Justice Deepak Mishra again, 2018 Supreme Court. And see, we have the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in its Article 16. Article 16. It says, "It opens with the words, 'I don't, I don't uh, remember the entire sentence. I cannot reproduce verbatim, but it starts with the words, 'Men and women of full age, without any inhibition or limitation, due to whatever caste, race, whatever that be, they have the right to marry.' Because, see, when you are having this universal declaration of human rights, which has been approved by the 13th judge bench." Saying that yes, this is an integral part of the constitution. 
para number 2176 of keshavananda bharati 13 judge bench of course it's a fraction fraction majority no <laughs> prem that was a prem that was reason why i said that i am there i am not there to say that a person has no right to choose his partner the only thing is so, whether that has been now, they, parental <laughs> love parental love the boundary is clear the boundary is the moment you become an adult then parental love or concern you cannot place any petrol that's Orient. outside the school or into the reason. moment you cross that you are an adult mm. so no, i think no. what the supreme court says and of course because article 21 it cannot be a nearly seen as a shining or twinkling star with a mere lip service that won't do but the brave when it comes when it affects others we very we, we can be very watchful <laughs> when it comes to when it, when it comes to our own that is people are very selfish True, because see, see, prem, one thing I tell, no, I, I, I had a occasion when I sat in the the in a 323 matter, I said that no, no grievous injury, nothing is there, one has slap. He is there, slap. to ask me, Sir, to compromise it. But think about if it happened to you, will you do it? I have no answer for that. <laughs> because everything depends upon the i mean the mind you are you are mindset that's all absolutely true because again see our own supreme court has cited another judgment of the us supreme court griswold versus connecticut it's a 65 it's a landmark decision of the us supreme court you can see what what a home means what marriage means what a family means see of course a home a family see, by the way you are state forgetting state. see are you are borrowing the uh, what do you call the ideology of foreign countries where the concept of marriage concept no, sir, of family is entirely different no, entirely different no 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 <laughs> kindly see article 21 comes from where it has been taken out culled out from the article 31 of the relatively new japanese constitution of 1946 written by americans almost same words and kindly see neerka gandhi maneka gandhi's case of 78 it says yes this is directly borrowed from the us constitution because at that point of time it was argued due process and procedure established by law both are different but says no this is same due process and procedure is the same so we have borrowed our constitution from various various nations everything was founded upon prem prem uh, like like ram kumar sir said abstract principles of uh, uh, law and uh, uh, the laudable uh, um, uh, what do you call uh, objects and reasons of different things are all fine but not inside my house that that's the way in which he even cited i mean uh, sir even cited an example of a judge who wanted third degree or fourth degree as long as he doesn't get that degree from his wife so i mean no, no because uh, i i will tell you wonderful. i will tell you personally i have only one daughter and she is now 22 i impose no petitions i merely told her now if you fall in love with somebody just tell me first just tell me first mm. you don't want it from a third person prem, 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 you should have you should have told don't come for merely of the session because don't come merely for my blessing persons. but inform me that you are <laughs> <laughs> prem you are i am in the same boat prem i am in the exactly huh? the same boat that you already are already a already a victim So yeah. you can cannot we have are, a different yeah, idea. No, I cannot tell you yeah, exactly. How Rao can sir. I tell my children not to do yes, something Rao that sir. I have done? Exactly, Rao sir. Rao yes, sir. sir, we are all casualties. Now let us hear from Shohei Hussain, who came all the way from north to south just to see another catastrophe. Please. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Uh, no, nothing like that. But it was a wonderful experience having gone this year. And uh, I don't know if the courts don't function. Maybe in 2021 January, I may pay another visit. Now to Kanya Kumari or maybe Indira Point because not to Alapura. No, that I visited, sir. This year I visited. <laughs> Last time you visited. <laughs> yes, sir. This year, this year I visited. It was a lovely experience, and uh, let's see if the court zone function in January. Maybe I would be go going. to Vinod and take a dig. Dig it, district. I see, sir. If, if only if the court zone function, because right now the situation is out here quite precarious. But then um, I just uh, like to add a note to what. Uh, the speaker as well as the introductor said that obviously the state is nowhere to be uh, meddled with in our time especially when uh, I, i think that this point is to be taken care of especially when when the recently provisions of domestic violence act were enforced and they recognized certain sort of living relationship 
in the form of marriage and their compensatory matters and their legal rights obviously since we are progressing to the next field or next era of generation then obviously this particular statute which is discouraging or meddling with human rights their affairs the couples affairs especially the next generation so i believe that uh, this seriously looks uh, greater i mean care and caution to be interfered with by obviously the legal jurists and other eminent speakers and lawyers so that's what i would like thank to you add. thank you shaheb and uh, as we come I'm to sir. the end of end of the session uh, thanks to our friend vijay and uh, our friends from andhra pradesh tomorrow our speaker is uh, advocate gandarama rao who is the chairman of the andhra pradesh bar council and i'm sure that uh, i mean he uh, it was scheduled on sunday but he want uh, because there is a uh, uh, enrollment on sunday uh, we are having it tomorrow uh, afternoon or uh, evening rather 4:30 so uh, till we meet again tomorrow topic, topic. evening uh, topic, uh, topic. Uh, uh, it is uh, we just told him anything to do with upholding the dignity of advocate as an officer of the court the role of bar council of india uh, sir, rather the bar council uh, uh, sir uh, i'll be contacting you immediately after the session so that uh, we can and vijay also please uh, we'll have to give him a topic he has uh, requested us i mean this is what he has got uh, the idea in his mind he wants us to frame a topic for him we will do that okay and uh, till we meet again tomorrow uh, 4:30 let us deliberate contemplate over whether majority is maturity till then do take care stay safe